So tonight's workshop, uh, politic, the politics of healthcare. Um, this is going to be a little bit faster workshop than, than the norm. Uh, we shouldn't be bumping two hours this time um, because it's you know it's it's really very straightforward information. There's not a lot of science behind it. It's just these are the facts of what's going on. So, uh, but the the goal and the objective of, the, of tonight's workshop is so that you walk out of here knowing how the politics are really slanted against you, but at the same time, just like anything else, you always have options. You know, you always have a way, a means to be able to get around it. It's just, you know, you, you just gotta know what you're doing. So um, I'm gonna finish off with this is the personal, you know, this is your personal list of things that you need to pay attention to or do, you know, in order to uh, kind of keep out or stay out of the system. Um, so the uh, the first thing, if you look at this chart here, this is healthcare spending as percent of gross domestic product across the world. Okay, so what you see, these are all the different countries: United States, Australia, you know, Mexico, United Kingdom. You know, all these different countries on here, and you see, for the most part, the rest of the world really stays in a very tight compaction because most of the world, you know, some would say because most of the world. Uh, you know, has organized healthcare systems, meaning that they have nationalized healthcare systems. They, you know, they're, that's what our government, of course, has promoted to us is that the reason we're in this mess is because we don't have a, a nationalized healthcare system. So we need to make, you know, we need to become like Canada. But uh, the reality is this, it, it has very little to do with that. It's, it's actually we and um, I think New Zealand are the only two countries uh, on the planet that allow direct to consumer marketing by pharmaceutical companies and by medical institutions. So no other country allows it and so that tends to drive up costs because you're inflating pharmaceutical profits as well as devices and everything else. That's the new that's the new thing coming now is electronic and medical devices. That's going to be the next wave everybody's going to have devices, right? Um, so uh, there is a simple reason healthcare in the United States costs more than it does anywhere else. The prices are higher. That's that's about as, as clean cut as it gets. It's just we inflate prices and there's no there's no competition in prices. Uh, they, they just gouge as much as they possibly can. And instead of doing cost effective measures like uh, you, you look at breast cancer screening, you could do thermography scans, which are incredibly cost effective. Uh, but anybody can do it. And it's a simple, it's a simple, basically infrared image that's taken. But you know, why would you do that if you can buy an expensive digital mammography system and charge out the leg to do it, right? And insurance is going to cover it, so it doesn't actually come out of your pocket. We're going to make you pay for insurance, and then the insurance will pay for it. So you see how it's all. It's not about efficiency or effectiveness. It's about capitalization. So. Uh, Give me control of a nation's money, and I care not who makes its laws. That's uh, that's what uh, Rothschild says. I'm sure some of you guys have heard that name before, but that's that's the truth. It it doesn't matter who's making the laws. If you control the wealth of a nation, you essentially control the laws, and this is how it works. It's called lobbying. So these are the top lobbyists in the United States from 1998 to 2014. The first one, of course, you have the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Now, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, of course, is a very large organization You know that, that goes across many platforms, but I want to point this out to you. What is the number one uh, industry, basically, in the United States? What's, what's the leader of gross domestic product in the, in the United States? It's healthcare. Yeah, so, so healthcare is one of the biggest pushers behind this, and it's just, it's just hidden underneath the, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, number two is the American Medical Association. Okay, they spent three hundred and ten million dollars not coming up with the cure for cancer, right, or the cure for heart disease, or teaching people how to have a real effective diet and and uh, you know lobbying to get sugar out of the food that we know is causing problems or against genetically modified products. They're not lobbying about against any of that. They're lobbying to protect their interests. At the government level, and to get legislation passed that protects them and doctors and pharmaceutical profits. Uh, then the next one is General Electric. Do you know General Electric? One of their major divisions is healthcare systems. They produce 
uh, mammography machines and CT machines and, and all this new glorious technology, right? Number four, the National Association of Realtors. Yeah, you know, odd connection there, but did you know that the American Cancer Society actually has, holds a tremendous amount of real estate across the country? They, they, they hold just an outrageous amount of actual property. Why? You know, I mean, you, you got you to gotta wonder why they need all this property, but they have tons of real estate, tons of buildings all over the place, yet they still mysteriously can't come up with a cure for cancer, not even one. For all the families can, that go yeah. in the hospital in the state. Yeah, yeah, it's unreal. The, the, uh, number four is the Amer or sorry, number five is the American Hospital Association. So obviously, you know that one's tied. Number six, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Uh, number seven, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and number eight, AARP, which also has to do with medical insurance. So you see, all of the biggest lobbyists are coming from the medical industry. And you're going to see why one of the last slides. You're going to see why that happens. It's it's gonna it's gonna make you sick, uh, or it's gonna make you ticked, right? Health spending of gross domestic product: seventeen point three percent in the United States in 2012 was spent was spent on health care. So seventeen percent of the United States economy is health care. That's ridiculous, right? That's that's unbelievable. That's almost a quarter. Almost all other nations are in the single digits. And it's not because they can't afford it. You look at the rest of the world, you look at Japan, and you look at Spain, and you look at France, and the UK, you know, all these other countries, it's less than 10%. It's not because they can't afford it. It's because their systems are, are, are under control to a degree. Um, and everybody's got their problems. And of course, you're going to watch the, you know, TV, you're going to watch the news, and they're going to talk about all the problems of the Canadian healthcare system, and you can never get care, and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they're, they're going to go all about that. But uh, nobody can say that we've got it right. And therefore, you know, the rest of the world should be looking at us. That's a joke. The rest of the world knows our healthcare system is the worst anywhere on the planet. Nobody else has a worse system. They've raked in, on the other hand, you could look at it and you can say, what are you talking about? We have a great system. We raked in $2.8 trillion despite expiring, uh, expiring drug patents. So that's this, this big deal going on right now with the, with the drug companies is all of their major drugs, they're, they're losing profits because their major drug patents are expiring and so they're starting to make generics. God forbid somebody else can make the drug that you've been charging $100 a pill for and it costs them what it really costs, a penny. You know, that's the kind of stuff that's happening. So the total health care spending worked out to $8,915 per person in the United States. Every man, woman, and child, it's costing almost $9,000 a year for health care. And, and you look at it and you're like, well, I didn't spend $9,000 last year in health care. You might not have but you're making up for everybody else that spent more than that, right? Because of insurance. You know, you look at how many people do have insurance, then you look at how many people don't have insurance, and you may not be spending it now, but you're gonna spend it later, right? It's, this is what it averages out to. So, let's look at the options to reduce these unsustainable costs. Number one option, promote wellness care. That seems like it makes sense, right? So, I wanna give you an example here, that because this is an example we can actually put numbers on. The average cost for an adult in our clinic for the basics, like the, the basic essentials to, uh, to, to cover your grounds, okay? You look at, at the, uh, the core fundamental sheet and it lists <coughs> off those, those different core fundamentals. This is what it would take to, to cover. If you had multiple adults in the household, or actually, yeah, that, that one is with multiple adults in the household or multiple family members, it's $100 per month, right? So that's $1,200 a year for chiropractic. This is per person, okay? This isn't for your whole family, this is per person. So $1,200 for chiropractic care, no insurance involved. Nobody else has to pay for that. That's that. Nobody else is chipping in, that's just your cost. $840 for daily doses of Nordic Naturals Pro Mega, Vitamin D Supreme, Iodine Synergy, and Essential Greens. So you're covering your basic fundamental nutrition too. That's going to cost about $840 per year. Okay? Then, uh, so that equals a total of $2,040. That's about the average of what it would take a person to just do the basic fundamentals. Now, anything above that, you know, if you need to do other things, 
you do those too. But you see the difference between 8,900 and 2,040, right? Okay, so uh, therefore you get 4.37 to 1 return on investment if you avoid sick care. You see how that works out? A fourfold difference if you avoid sick care. Another way of looking at it is this. If you pay the national average for just five years, if you get sick for five years and it just costs you the national average, we're not talking about, see, you, you understand, if you get sick, it costs more than the national average typically. Mm -hmm. If you were actually seeing the realized costs, it costs more than that. If you just pay the national average for five years, you get 22 years of doing wellness care for that same cost. 22 wow. years. So you look at the numbers, I mean, just look at the basics behind this, and you see this is a no-brainer. Wellness care should be mandated. We should be teaching people diet. We should be doing the things from a government level to pull the disastrous stuff out of our food so it's not driving sickness. We should be putting limits on soda. We should be putting limits on uh, the use of soybean oils and fast food and all this other stuff. But that's not happening because that's not profitable. Number two option is you reduce pharmaceutical and medical costs. Is that gonna happen? No. That's not gonna happen. So number three is you restrict access, you pay providers less, you, you create uncovered charges anywhere that you can by making all kinds of limitations and restrictions, and you raise patient premiums. So if you're, if you're the government, which one, you know, and you're being promoted by lobbyists, uh, which one do you think we're going to choose? Okay. Number three, obviously. So let's look and see how this is translated. Obamacare. Number one, access restrictions. System bogged down by free preventive services and essential health benefits package that do not cover chiropractic, they don't cover vitamins, they don't cover gym memberships, they don't cover anything that actually promote health. All they do, they're, they're considered essential health benefits and they're things like getting your blood pressure tested and getting your weight checked and getting a mammogram and getting a... Uh, 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 a, a vaginal exam, right? Doing all these different things that are just, they don't do anything to promote health. They're just screening assessments, right? We good? Yeah. Okay. Um, number two, provider cuts. Medicare value-based purchasing is, is one of these, these new initiatives and uh, electronic health record standards. So, so we're on an electronic health record system. And I, I wanna explain to you real quickly how this works. So we, we've been using electronic system for a while now, but now we have this new setup within the system called PHI, patient health information. And whenever we start a new patient, we have to tag in certain pieces of information. Okay, and that goes into the national database and that, that is tracked and it goes into the system and you have to record, you have to report these certain measures. Things like your diagnosis codes, um, things like do you smoke, do you drink? Um, but one of the, you know, some of the things that we don't have to put in yet but are kind of scary is what is your vaccination record? Uh, you know, what, what is your race? What is your, you know, these, these different, the, I mean, there's measures in there that would make you say, what? Like, I mean, and but of course it's relevant so that you get the best health care possible. It's unreal. But these are the things that are going to be continuing to happen. Um, you know, so, so the idea is put in as little as possible. <laughs> as little as possible. Just meet the standards. Uh, but they can be used to cut provider payments or cut you out of the system completely. So let's say that you're not providing the data and they go to the point where they just declare flat out in the law, if you're not meeting these records, no reimbursement whatsoever. You're cut, they eliminate doctors from the field. Right, you're, you're literally, you're out just like that because you're not part of the system. So this is, this is how it's all working and this is where it's going. Medicaid will be expanded by at least 17 million Americans, which is a completely failed system, by the way. I mean, it, it, Medicaid is a joke. Uh, while Medicare payments 
will be cut, uh, that the, the, the cuts there are going to exceed $400 billion. Wow. If you're on Medicare, they're cutting it by $400 billion. If you're getting close to Medicare, they're cutting your future health care by $400 billion. Hmm. And it was great health care to start with, right? Hmm. <laughs> so that, these, that, that's how you do it, provider cuts. Number three, uncovered procedures, an independent payment advisory board. Think about the implications there. Independent Payment Advisory Board will be used to determine what procedures are reimbursed and which ones are not. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to pay for your, pro your procedure that you need? Well, they don't pay for it. They don't want to pay for a new technology that has promise? They won't pay for it, right? Uh, further, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institutes. The Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. These are, these are just amazing, right? I mean, it's like you see what they call them, but you can see where these things could lead to. This will be used to compare treatment options for disease. Hmm. So here's this option, here's that option. Now, you know, good could come from that. But honestly, do you think they're really going to be looking at the comparative outcome of a chiropractic regimen of corrective care versus back surgery or physical therapy? Or, or, or medication protocols. Do you think they're going to look at that? No. You know, this is just a matter of putting something out there that they can, that they can continue to regulate and, and control the, the, the profit stream that's already there. This is just a measure of controlling even further as patients are going outside of the system. You've seen this overflow of patients are, are starting to move and pay more and more and more out of pocket for health care because they're seeing that what the system is providing is not what they want. So the, the out-of-pocket expenses in this country have just gone skyrocketing in the last five years. Where is it going? It's going to things like chiropractic, it's going to things like nutrition, it's going to uh, you know, massage and acupuncture and naturopaths and, you know, and all this other stuff. It's, and so this is just a, a measure to gain control of it once again. Okay, uh, I love this. Change into a truck. That's the best. That's the best uh, version of that poster. I, could, I I I just came across that. I had to put it on here. I love that. Uh, so it has nothing to do with the with the presentation whatsoever. Hey, we were talking about Obama, and uh, you know, and then I saw that poster, and I was like, all right, there there's a version of that poster I like. That's that's the real change right there. Change into a truck. Uh, <laughs> Blue Cross Blue Shield bets big on Obamacare exchanges. Okay, this was an article that was written June 21st of 2013. Uh, this was a story done in the Washington Post. It says, at a closed White House meeting, a closed White House meeting in April, President Barack Obama told corporate insurance bosses, we're all in this together on implementing his signature health law. But some insurance companies seem to be more in than others. At least five... Blue Cross Blue Shield executives sat at the table of a dozen, that's 12, right? So five of the 12 were Blue Cross Blue Shield executives, okay? Uh, sat at the table of about a dozen CEOs with the president, according to those knowledgeable about the session. First reported by the New York Times, just as significant, uh, so just those knowledgeable about the session, which means it was not open, just as significant is who wasn't there. Chiefs of the country's biggest and third, so the biggest is United Healthcare. The third biggest is Aetna, and they were not present at that meeting. Hmm. It was only Blue Cross, the second largest in the country. Okay. So let's look at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama, for example. 2013 assets were over three billion dollars. Okay, this is in our in our state. Over 85% market share of Alabama coverage. It's approaching 90%. In fact, they are in. Uh, they are. They are actually in a uh, lawsuit right now. Somebody, I don't know who, but somebody sued them, and uh, and they they put in a motion to deny uh, going into this antitrust lawsuit. But they were denied that motion. So, in other words they can, they're proceeding with an antitrust lawsuit against Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama, which could have major implications, really good implications for, you know, for the people. 
Um, but as of right now, it's approaching 90% market share. They own 90% of the private insurance in the state of Alabama. That's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Coca-Cola doesn't have 90% market share, right? Uh, 2012 study showed Alabama the least competitive market <coughs> in the United States. Do you know that a lot of my chiropractic friends in this state, they don't accept Blue Cross, therefore they're cash completely. They don't accept insurance at all. They just do cash. It's like if you're going to do insurance, you have to take Blue Cross Blue Shield because that's the only one that most people have. I mean, easily nine out of ten patients that come in here, they have Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance. If they have insurance, if they don't, you know, they pay cash. Uh, this month kicked the uh, this month Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama kicked Northeast Alabama Regional Medical Center, an entire hospital, simply because they challenged compensation. They found that they were getting paid up to 30% less than other area hospitals for the same procedures. But see, because the hospitals negotiate rates with the insurers, when they went after it and they said, look, we're not able to meet our bills. We're, do you know that most hospitals, it's like over half of the hospitals in this state are upside down. They're actually, uh, they're actually losing money. You know, so and that a lot of that starts here because they're 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 cutting compensation rates, uh, despite you know their their tremendous asset pool. Uh, they they are registered. Get this, they're registered as a not for profit entity in the in the uh, state of Alabama. So this is really interesting because this came up um, when we were looking into we were looking into a while back. They passed a law that allows doctors of chiropractic to refer directly to PTs, okay? So think about how this goes. That means that a PT, we could refer you to a PT and get your PT done. Well, that also means that we could hire a PT, right? And then we, I could refer the PT services to the PT, and then we could just do the chiropractic. And it would actually help the patient. Right, because you would have less of out-of-pocket expenses because you're you're separating those benefits, right? So we looked into this and hit a dead end because we found out that they're a not-for-profit entity, therefore they didn't have to follow the rules of a typical corporate entity. However, that works out. This 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 you know all the lawyer lingo. I don't I don't I don't get it all, but uh, that that's basically what I came to. So where do the profits go? Where you know obviously they they have all these profits. Where do they go? What do you think? So Nonprofit, so they've got to go somewhere. Lobby. This was an article that was posted here recently. Headline, top 10 executives at Alabama's Blue Cross doubled their pay in the last two years, according to AL.com just a week ago. So CEO Terry Kellogg is pulling home now $4.84 million. And you just go down the list, the top 10 executives making over a million dollars. So... They're they're pulling in all this money, and they're a nonprofit. They can't they can't you know they got to do something with it. So rather than cutting premiums, they raise their employee pay. Amazing, isn't it? Because I mean, I, if you're a CEO of a major company, you need four point eight four million dollars. Find it interesting. Your legal is the least paid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if he wants to keep his job, you know, he's got to take what he can get. Yeah, it's just, you know, I mean, am I against necessarily people making that kind of money? No. No. I mean, I don't think anybody in here is. But you see a conflict of principle at some point. You know, if, if you are, if, if, I have no problem with Steve Jobs making the money that he made. He made it, I mean, he made darn good products, right? Apple makes darn good products. I have no problem with the, G, the, the CEO of GM making that kind of money. As long as they pay the government back first, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I have no problems with that. But you know, there there's a there is a problem. There's a conflict of interest when it's your premiums from people who you know can't really. You know, I mean, they're struggling to pay their bills, and they're paying these inflated premiums for healthcare they're not using in order so that they can protect pharmaceutical and insurance company profits. Uh -huh. There's something wrong about that. You know, nobody's going to argue that point. Okay, so Obamacare Section 2706, non-discrimination in health care. Did you guys know about this? 
Insurers may not discriminate on plan coverage against any health care provider that is acting within the scope of applicable licensure under state's laws. So what that says, th this was a big deal when it got in there, okay? But so far, we still, you understand, we have no idea what that is actually going to mean and how it's going to be twisted into actual function. But what that says right there is that if I, as a chiropractor, am licensed to take an x-ray or perform an exam, then there is no legal right to pay my medical counterpart with the same education twice or three times as much as what they pay me, which is exactly what happens right now. Okay? They, they systematically pay medical doctors vastly larger amounts for the same procedures, okay? The same exact procedures. Uh, so these are just a few examples of what's going on right now in chiropractic, just so you can see how this works. Medicare currently does not cover examinations. They don't cover x-rays, they don't cover therapies, or anything else to a chiropractor other than adjustments at a cut value price, okay? And they don't pay for maintenance care. They only pay for it as long as it's functional, pain relief care and you have to document everything else you know all the, everything that goes hand in hand with that but they only pay for adjustments so here's the irony you have to prove medical necessity for the adjustment right but they won't pay for the examinations and the x-rays to prove that it's medically necessary talk about an oxymoron right mm. okay um Next one here, not one time in my 10-year career have I received a Medicaid check. Not one time, ever. Never seen a Medicaid payment. So it's scary to think that that might be a guideline for what Obamacare is, is really going to manifest as. Pretty scary. Blue Cross Blue Shield. There's a whole list here. This is just the big ones. Most plans have chiropractic limits as small as $400 a year. They maximize, you're maxed out at $400 or 12 visits, whichever one is met first. Doesn't matter what your problem is, you can blow out a disc. You could blow out a disc three or four times in a year. Sorry, you got $400, but that's it. Medical necessity restrictions that are not seen in any other sector of healthcare. When you go into your medical doctor, do, do, they, do they have to uh, prove medical necessity to get paid for the examination of you? Yes. yes? They're starting to now. Well, they, they all, sometimes they'll make up stuff to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, I, I guess what I'm saying is this. The, the, the valuation of medical ne necessary versus wellness care procedures are not regulated in, in the medical field the way that they are in chiropractic, which I guess to a degree, I can kind of agree with that, um, meaning that medical doctors never do wellness care. I mean, right? I mean, what do they do that's actual wellness care? Do they put you on a treadmill and run you? Do they take you to the gym? Do they give you uh, a, a good diet plan? Do they get you off of medications? Do they adjust your neck or your spine? Do they detox you? You know, so they really don't do wellness care. So I mean, that that point kind of makes okay. sense. But if we see that wellness care can reduce medical costs, which has been proven numerous times, you would think they would pay for wellness care willingly if it's going to cut their long-term costs. Here's the problem with this, and I've covered this before. The reason why insurance companies do not pay for wellness care is this: Medicare. That's the reason. Because let's say you're, I'm going to get your age wrong, but let's say you're 52. Okay. okay? And when you get on Medicare? I don't know. 65, 60. right? 64. Okay. 64 and a half. Yeah. Close enough. So uh, count down the days, right? Uh, so you've got basically 13 years until you are Medicare's problem. Mm -hmm. So as an insurance company, I don't care about keeping you healthy. I don't care about keeping you well and paying for all that. My job is simply this, to pay for as little as I possibly have to 
to sur you know to to pass you by for the next 13 years until you are off my list and you're somebody else's problem. Hmm. That's why we're in the mess of the way that we are. It's because of the way that Medicare works. Insurance companies, they're not, yeah, they're not uncovered procedures like DMX, a digital motion x-ray, according, I've got the, the document on my desk where uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama deems digital motion x-ray as a as a non-medically necessary procedure is basically a test or a, uh, uh, what do they call it, an experimental procedure. An experimental procedure that's been around, you know, I mean, fluoroscopy has been around forever. The irony behind it is the number one government recommended diagnostic tool for whiplash and cervical spine injury is, guess what? Digital fluoroscopy. That is the measure that they say should be used to diagnose these conditions in their own manuals. And uh, th this, is a, this is a pretty neat story that hasn't really fully developed yet, but um, uh, the, the AMA was actually going after DMX, the company. And, uh, and they ended up in a room, here they're in, I think they're headquarters in Chicago, uh, but they were up in the room with the CEO of the, the, the head lady of the American Medical Association and about five lawyers and then here was Dr. John, the owner of DMX and his lawyer. And, uh, and they basically were saying that, you know, this is an experimental procedure. No, you know, we are completely canning this technology. Nobody's going to use it. And, uh, and he said, uh, he said, are you guys aware that your recommendations it says in your own documents uh, that that this is the diagnostic tool of choice for for evaluating whiplash injury and cervical spine injury, and they said we don't follow any guidelines. He said, "Really?" And he looked at his lawyer, and his lawyer handed them across the table to him. They didn't even know it was in their own books as as recommending it as the diagnostic tool of choice. So so the you know the end of the story that's kind of being slated out right now is their lawyer said, what do you need from us? In other words, what do we need to sign to, you know, to say that we've left you alone? So that, you know, their, their hands are off now. And so this is going to be a, you know, the, it'll, it'll be finalized here in, in the next, uh, I think they said it was coming up in a couple of weeks, so it might have already passed as of right now. <coughs> but anyways, it is the diagnostic tool, yet they don't cover it in this state. On any Blue Cross Blue Shield policy, so so in other words, the only way that people can get that done is by paying cash for it, or by uh, like personal injury cases and and workers comp cases that will allow it to be paid, or other insurance companies that will pay for it. So uh, restricts therapy usage with such lingo, they could deny literally anything. So the way that if if you look at our guideline book and you read out how things are done and what the restrictions are. They, they, link, they put the lingo in there to where it doesn't matter what you do, you could document everything and they could still sit there and say, well, it's in our opinion that that was not medically necessary. And I know this to be true because I actually got uh, audited my first year on two files, two patient files. And I sat in a room and there was a chiropractor that was wearing a suit that was working for Blue Cross Blue Shield. And he and he sat there, and we went back and forth for about half an hour. I was, I mean, I was young. I was 24 years old, and I'm sitting here trying to argue with a lawyer, the head of Blue Cross Blue Shield, and this chiropractor in a suit, you know. And and his, he just kept on saying, "Well, in my opinion, well, in my opinion," and I'm like, "Look, I don't want to know what your opinion is, sir. I want to know what are the rules." couldn't get it out of them. It, it, it literally, it, it made no difference whatsoever. It just came down to, they have the guidelines, we sign the contract, they can use those guidelines against you any way they want to. So if you raise any red flags, they're coming to your door. That, that's the way it works. Okay, so competitive results. This is what it actually translates out to. Okay, when you look at how all these legal, legalities, I just want to paint a picture for you of how it works on a professional level. Uh, th this is according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. A chiropractor does not make a, a bad income. I mean, you can see why people go to chiropractic school. Uh, the average income in the United States is seventy-eight thousand. Okay, uh, physical therapist, on the other hand, who 
does you know a lot of the same stuff as a chiropractor actually has less education than a chiropractor until they made the doctorate program yet they were making more eighty two thousand a year a physician's assistant not even a doctor makes ninety four thousand a nurse practitioner who is not really a doctor is you know the the next year down ninety five thousand my sister was a pharmacist she was making well over a hundred thousand dollars when she quit her job because she couldn't give drugs to people anymore um a dentist, 164, a pediatrician, 170, GP, 183. Uh, you, you see this, a regular medical doctor is paid twice what the average chiropractor is. Twice. Okay, that, that's a big deal. I mean, that's a huge jump. That's over $100,000 difference. And then a surgeon, of course, uh, 233,000. Now, here's what I want you to pay attention to, though. This is, this, this is the big picture. If you look at this in terms of the actual patients per day that we see versus malpractice costs. Because if you look at the average doctor, okay, you look at the average surgeon, how many surgeries do you think a surgeon does in a single day? No idea. Not that many. Two or three? You know, I mean, it's not, I mean, especially if they're longer surgeries, they're not doing a tremendous number of surgeries. Uh, your, your typical medical doctor, you know, how many patients do they see in a day? You know, they're in and out of the room every 15 minutes, you know, or so, average 15 minutes per patient. Um, so you compare that to what the average chiropractor sees. Most chiropractors see more patients than medical doctors do. In fact, even though only 7% of the population sees chiropractors, they, uh, as of 2004, the statistic came out that there were more individual visits to chiropractors than any other medical professional. So the numbers are pretty clear. I mean, in this office, I see over 200 patients a week. So just today, I don't know what the number was today, but you know, 60 something, yeah. So, you know, we, we see a lot of people, yet you look at what that actually translates out to, I only paid, this is my real number, $1,051 in malpractice insurance last year. That's my actual malpractice insurance cost, okay? I pay more, for car insurance, you know, I, 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 it's, it's literally, I pay more for car insurance than that. A general practitioner pays four to 6,000. So they pay four to six times as much in malpractice insurance. So the real simple question, if, I mean, if you look at these two together, a medical doctor and a chiropractor, you, you, you can agree, we probably see about the same number of patients per day in an average office, yet they're paying four to six times more in malpractice insurance. Which one is more dangerous and has more side effects? The GP. And they're not even touching anybody. All they're doing is handing them stuff, right? So uh, you look at a surgeon, 10 to 15,000. In some areas of the country, they're, they're paying 40 to $60,000 in malpractice insurance. Like in areas of New York, Staten Island and such. And down in Miami. So, you know, they're, they're looking at this and they're like, oh, well, we need to have tort reform, right? We need to cut the ability for you to sue the doctor that screws you up. <laughs> That's the answer to it. No. Like, are you serious? How about we not <coughs> hurt people? That would be the solution to it. I always, I always like to mention that, that uh, the, the chiropractic thing, most of that cost is not because of injuries. It's actually because of sexual harassment lawsuits. Hmm. That's, that's where the most of, most of them come from because, because of doctors that are in closed rooms with patients doing dumb things. You know, they, they see their patients and shut the door. That's, you see that? That's, that's, that's why we don't have doors, <laughs> right? So no situations can come up. Um, yes? To interject and tie this back to your insurance company via their agents, their ENO, I know for just a basic ENO policy, he pays eighteen forty eight a year, so he has to pay more than you have to pay as an agent for his own selling of insurance. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's uh, just on an interesting side note. Um, you know, just looking at insurance costs. I uh, over at Red Bar at the coffee shop, we are we are investigating. We're, we're putting together the information now to to get a liquor license to be able to do. Um, coffee liquors and you know organic wine stuff like that you know for the nighttime stuff mm -hmm. and the insurance the liquor liability you have to have a separate insurance policy mm -hmm. to serve liquor and it's seven it was seven hundred and eighty dollars 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so the 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 insurance to give somebody a glass of wine is actually almost as much as I pay to adjust fourteen thousand patients a year. That's how many adjustments I do on an average year, around fourteen thousand. So. Uh -huh. You see the safety there. It doesn't make any sense. You see, that, that's, a, that's a picture I'm pointing out. This makes no political sense whatsoever. All right. The thing that bugs me is that people think the FDA is protecting them. It isn't. What the FDA is doing and what the public thinks it's doing are as different as night and day. That was Dr. Herbert Lay, the ex-FDA commissioner. Wow. Okay, the guy that ran the whole thing and he says, it's not what you think it is. It is a protection firm. That's what they do. So here's a few examples of what the FDA has uh, protected or, or condemned. Uh, home births. At your own legal risk, can you have a home birth in 23 states in the United States, uh, including Alabama? So in 23 states, there is no licensure available. And if you choose to have a home birth, you potentially could go to jail for practicing medicine without a license. Raw milk, sale for human consumption is illegal in 17 states, including Alabama. You cannot buy it. And in a whole slew of other ones, there's a lot of contingencies to it. Like you, you can buy it for veterinary use and yada, yada, yada. Uh, vaccine religious exemptions for, uh, to, to get your childhood vaccinations are available in all states but Mississippi and West Virginia. That's a good thing, right? But uh, philosophical only exemptions are only available in 19 states. So in only 19 states can you get a philosophical exemption simply on the basis you don't want it. Now the good news is on that measure is the definition of religion is your own personal set of beliefs and convictions. So that is an open enough territory that you can, that you can say, I don't have to tell you what my religion is. They, they can't ask. You just, say, you just say it's against my religion. They can't ask you, what is your religion? It doesn't matter if you're Southern Baptist. It doesn't matter what the Southern Baptist belief is. You don't have to do it. Um, in 2011, the Supreme Court ruled vaccine makers, this one is insane, were protected from lawsuits. Did you know that? They are immune from lawsuits. Setting up a vaccine injury court, which only two have gotten through to date. Uh, Bailey Banks and uh, who was the other the other one? Um, anyways, there were two that were that were proven in the court that the vaccines the one that the vaccine caused autism, and the other one proved uh, I don't know if that one was autism or not, but it was it was an obvious injury. So they they had the the, the documentation and the everything fell perfectly into place that there was no excuse they could prove without any shadow of a doubt that it caused the autism. So, you know, if it caused, if they can prove it in one case, what does that say about the others? There's a vast possibility. Just follow the trends. Um, not to mention the uh, MIT study that came out. A lot of you guys may not know about it. MIT came out with a study in 2012 that showed that it was a combination of aluminum in the vaccines and Tylenol that was actually uh, working together to deplete fo uh, sulfur levels in, your, in, your, in the child's developing brain, and that caused them, it threw them into a tailspin, and that's the cause of autism. Hmm. MIT, one of the most prestigious universities in the country, and they nailed it. Nobody knows about that one. Amazing. Uh, so the, the funny thing is, seatbelt injury lawsuits are perfectly acceptable. Like, you, you can sue if you get hurt by a seatbelt. And the, the auto industry is regulated, but the vaccine industry, untouchable. Huh. Crazy. crazy. Parents forced medical care upon their children, such as the Parker Jensen case. Parker Jensen, um, this, this was a case where his, uh, his, he w went into a hospital. It's in the movie Doctored. If you guys have not seen that movie Doctored, um, he went in and they tested him and they told him that he had some rare form of cancer. Okay. And they, they, uh, the parents said, we don't want to do the chemotherapy. And they said, you have to. Mm. And so they literally ran away with their, with their kid. The, the hospital put out a warrant for arrest for the parents. Mm -hmm. and, and actually went to the point where the dad actually turned himself in. And, they, and the kid ended up being forced through 
uh, the chemotherapy treatments. And he's still alive now, but the interesting part behind it they talk about in the movie is that they found out that there was actually a drug trial being that that hospital was was registered for a drug trial of the drug that they put him on. And so what they what they anticipate might have happened is that they couldn't find enough drug trial participants with that rare form of cancer, so they just pinned him with it so that they could validate the trial and get paid for it. Hmm. Unreal. Uh, in 2013, Obama signed H.R. 933, referred to as a Monsanto Protection Act. While since 1995, over $18 billion has been subsidized to big agribusiness. So they literally signed a, uh, oh, President Obama signed this bill that makes Monsanto or any other company that does genetically modified seeds, they are able to continue to sell their product even if they are found to be damaging to the human body. So if they find that they're causing cancer, they can continue to sell it with complete immunity. Unreal. They also, while Monsanto persists a revolving door with the FDA, um, they, they have a perpetual revolving door where uh, people such as Hillary Clinton and Judge Clarence Thomas and you know these big names are in and out of government and they all had previous jobs with Monsanto. Some of them have gone back and forth multiple times. They just swing back and forth between the FDA and government levels and, and uh, Monsanto. Uh, and also, Monsanto continues to buy up all organic and seed companies that they can either buy out or choke out. So they're doing everything they can to, bolt, to, to buy seed companies and buy food companies. So even companies that you think are good organic brands, they're actually turned out, they're owned by Monsanto, they're owned by Cargill, they're owned by these big companies. So they're, they're systematically removing them you know, and, and uh, controlling the access so to you'll them. you'll have to buy seeds from them instead of having your, your own You got it. Heroin. So, so if, you, if, if you guys garden, save seed. <laughs> Make sure you're saving your seed. It's actually better to do that anyways. We're going to be doing a gardening workshop, uh, I think in February of next year, where we're going to be going through all that stuff on how to self-sustain food. So that'll be a good one. I am deeply troubled by the landscape with which I'm forced to practice in. It never used to be this way, but nowadays there needs to be a clear-cut divorce between scientific affairs and marketing. When you get into big business and healthcare, it's ugly. When health is bought, it crosses a line. And it's not a political line, it's a human line. She became addicted to hydrocodone, Vicodin. When she tried to withdraw, she became extremely depressed and she committed suicide. And the way that she did that was by burning herself alive. It's a business. They're in the business of making profit. The pharmaceutical industry spent $20 million lobbying on health care this year. An indictment of what the U.S. government does to some of the most vulnerable children in this country. The vaccine big pharma industry pushing dangerous products. There is undoubtedly a connection between these vaccines and diseases such as autism. Merely asking for further research to be done led the world to come down on my shoulders. The medical journal he is calling his study an elaborate fraud. It's a marketing exercise to get the biggest return on an expensive vaccine. The federal government says we're going to use taxpayer dollars to ensure the vaccine manufacturers. If I'm injured by this, me against the federal government, what's the likelihood that I can prevail here? I wouldn't give your average American physician that much credit. Doctors were not receiving fair balanced information. They were receiving marketing information designed to increase the bottom line of the portfolio of the drug companies that I worked for. There's no ethics anymore. The average spine surgeon makes $800,000 a year doing unnecessary back surgeries. But they make a million dollars in royalties from Medtronics. So of course they're going to put as much metal in people's spines as they can. It's easy to get seduced into that type of a lifestyle. You are winding and dying. Some clinicians could have asked for pretty much whatever they wanted and gotten it. Obama said in 2007, we would label genetically modified foods. Because Americans should know where their food comes from. It's virtually impossible to pass effective legislation to let people know 
whether or not the food they're purchasing has genetically engineered components or not. Very large agribusiness companies like Monsanto, Syngenta, Cargill, like Dow, they're in charge of our food supply. They don't want anyone to know, number one, that they're even eating GMOs, and number two, what the GMOs are doing to them. Now you have genetic species that are cross-species in something that we are consuming. President Obama this week signed into law the Monsanto Protection Act. It would allow Monsanto Corporation to have complete immunity from the federal courts. Snuck into a huge agricultural bill without review by a committee. So if you get sick, too bad, you can't take it to court. You're talking about very deep pockets and they get their agendas pushed through Congress. Not everybody plays by the rules, and when you get the outliers of people who are cheating on either end of the equation is when the problems begin to start. You look at the game, you recognize the stakes, you look at the impact, there's something really wrong here. Okay, so that, uh, that video bought, um, that movie is actually the one that's coming out here. Uh, I think it's coming out September 5th is the release date and um, we actually have rights to play it in the in the theater to get streamed in the theater as a contributor to the film so uh, we're going to be putting together a uh, you know whatever it's probably going to be a one night deal but my request is this get people to the movie buy tickets we're going to be selling tickets it's going to be like five bucks a ticket or something like that but invite people to that movie, bring people. We need to pack out that theater. The last time uh, we did Doctor the same way and, and we had probably half the theater full, something like that, but we want to make sure that this time we do it right and it's, it's completely packed out because, I mean, it's powerful stuff and this one is going to be a huge hit on vaccines, on the pharmaceutical industry and profits and GMOs. It hits it harder, they say, than any other film that's been out. This, this, this uh, apparently is going to be the kind of film that you get blackballed for, yeah. like completely blackballed. So I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait. What's the it's about time somebody steps up. What's the name? I Bought. 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 Yep. Okay. So th this is a really touchy topic for me and, 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 and a very real topic. Uh, that I'm about to hit because because this is this has always just bothered me so much uh, as as you can obviously tell um, as we're going through the information but get this in the 19th century respect for the certainty of science was in stark contrast to the quackery and mysticism of 19th century medicine what they're talking about there is the the difference between allopaths and homeopaths Basically, the, the natural doctors on one side and the allopathic doctors on the other side. So this sector of doctors, including medical doctors, I mean, there was a group of, you know, the half of them were doctors that believe the body healed itself and that we should deal with things naturally. The other half were the doctors that believe the body doesn't heal itself, that we have to heal the body, and they use drugs and chemicals and potions and lotions to be able to do it. Cut, poison, burn. That was basically the idea. So to emphasize a transition to a more scientific approach to modern medicine, physicians sought to represent themselves as scientists. So they began to wear the most recognizable symbol of the scientist, the white laboratory coat. That, that little depiction is from Wikipedia, from just regular open source. Okay, that's, that's where the white coats actually came from. And the reason why I go through this is because it never ceases to amaze me how uh, the, the I mean, it's almost like a caste system or, or like some form of, of like uh, slavery or social structure or something like that where, you know, people will, you'll give them all the information in the world, you know, and it's not everybody, but you'll give certain people all the information they need to, to do well or you give them all the facts, but then they go to their medical doctor and they spend three minutes with them and the doctor just, what? you know, take this, you know, or something, and they walk out and start taking it. And you're, and I'm standing here slapping myself in the head like, are you kidding me? I just gave you all the information on what to do, what it does, and everything else, and now what's happening, you're standing here in front of me, you're complaining about the side effects of what you're going through and all the problems that you're having because you did what I told you not to do in the first place and I told you what was going to happen if you did it. All because you chose to listen to your medical doctor because he said, but right? Why? Why? Right? That's a big question. Where does that come from? 
And so there's this giant hypocrisy when it comes to the idea of quackery and everything and, and the difference in doctors and all that. Uh, so these are just a, a few of the different, um, the, the different people in history that, that are labeled on uh, Wikipedia as being quacks, labeled as quacks. This is actually from their list. Okay, Thomas Allenson, uh, born in 1858, died in 1918, was the founder of naturopathy, okay, uh, as a profession. He opposed the use of drugs and vaccination. Therefore, he was labeled a quack. He was an adamant opposer of drugs and vaccinations. He said they were dangerous. Don't do them, okay, labeled a quack. John Harvey Kellogg, 1852 to 1943, he was a medical doctor. He was actually a Seventh-day Adventist. And so he was labeled a quack because he was uh, teaching people in his sanatorium to breathe and to eat right. He created Kellogg's Corn Flakes because that was, uh, that was one of the cures you know, to a to healthy body is to eat these natural foods. Um, ironically enough, he was one of, you know, so he was labeled a quack for that, but he was one of the most staunch proponents for uh, pariah circumcision. The way that circumcisions are performed today, where they cut the entire fork, foreskin off, he was one of the major proponents of that. And, and his basis was, based on his religion, he was adamantly opposed to masturbation. So he thought that was the cure, was pariah circumcision and cornflakes. We covered that in one, of, in one of the last... This is true. This is true. That was what his promoted, uh, uh, his, his promoted solution was, cornflakes and circumcision. So, you know, they're going to keep that, of course, you know, because, hey, that's a viable procedure, but, but you know, he's still a quack because of the cornflakes. Um, <coughs> D.D. Palmer, you guys might recognize that name. He's the developer of chiropractic. 1845 to 1913, he discovered chiropractic when he was assessing his, jan his uh, uh, janitor. He noticed the janitor had been deaf his entire life in one ear, and he described an event as a child where he... You know, he injured himself, and he remembered that was the moment when he lost his hearing. So he was assessing his spine, and he found, you know, a, a bone significantly out of place. He adjusted it, and the guy's hearing came back. You know, any chiropractor that's been out has had an experience something like that. I mean, I've had experiences where, uh, you know, a guy was paralyzed for um, eight years, couldn't, couldn't feel anything below his waist. I had to help him up onto the table in a wheelchair. And uh, I adjusted his neck and then, and then uh, had him face down after adjusting his neck. And I put my hand on his leg and his head shot up. And he goes, I can feel that. And, and I was like, sorry. <laughs> like, what'd I do? He's like, no, you don't understand. I haven't been able to feel anything in my legs since, since I got, he actually got shot in the spine. You know, so all of us have had experiences like that, but he was labeled a quack. You know, because, of course, he developed chiropractic. Um, Louis Pasteur, 1822 to 1895, he invented pasteurization. He was labeled a quack for, for uh, the idea of the germ theory. He was like, you know, everybody said, that's insane. Disease isn't caused by germs. You know, you're, this pasteurization, psh, whatever. Yeah, he's fine now. <laughs> right, he's fine. We can do that all day long. Linus Pauling, 1901 to 1994. He promoted the effectiveness of vitamin C and cancer therapy. Quack, what are they doing right now? They're starting it. Vi intravenous vitamin C therapy is becoming very popular. Uh, liposomal vitamin C is just now becoming known. That's what we started doing it over at, uh, over at uh, Red Bar. They started serving liposomal vitamin C. Uh, liquid smiles, right? Uh, not for cancer treatment, for the record. Not for cancer treatment. It's just a drink, and it tastes great. <laughs> Joseph Mercola, 1954 to present. Uh, he's still alive, of course. He's a DO operating the largest online health website. He is a quack, right? Even though most of his stuff that they've been promoting, you know, stuff that you've seen on his website for years, is every other week on the Dr. Oz show and everything else now. You know, but he's a quack, right? So there's this massive hypocrisy about labeled quackery. And what it comes down to is anybody that opposes the system is a quack. Right? That's what it comes down to. Everybody that opposes the system is a quack. Now, here's the funny part. Only 50% of medical interventions are supported by solid scientific evidence. 
partly because only 1% of the articles in medical journals are scientifically sound. They're scientifically flawed in the first place, and partly because many treatments have never been assessed at all. Hmm. Only 15% of what they do is based on science. How dare they tell anybody else that they're not scientific? It's insane. It is insane. Right? You do research, right? <laughs> Can you agree with that? It's getting better, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, there's... Yeah. The, well, what, what, is, what is everybody saying? Um, that we need, to, we need to get the journals. Right? Everybody's saying we got to get the drug companies out of the journals. That as long as the drug companies are funding the journals, they're going to be flawed because they drive the research. So uh, here's, here's the point. <coughs> is if you, and, and this is honest, okay? And I'm going to be as honest as I can be. Are there geniuses in the, in the medical field? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Here's another question. Are there geniuses in the chiropractic field? Sure. Absolutely. Yes. Are there geniuses in the naturopathic field? Absolutely. Now let's ask it a different way. Is every doctor, chiropractor, naturopath, acupuncturist, are they all geniuses? No. No. Because no. I went to school with a lot of them. <laughs> right? I know how it works. And I mean, our school is just as difficult as medical school. In fact, we uh, chiropractors get more credit hours in human anatomy and physiology and how the body actually works. That's why medicine specializes everything because they don't have time to learn the entire body. That's inconvenient, right? They need all the time for the drugs and the uh, differential diagnosis and the psychology, right? That all that other important stuff, physiology and anatomy. That's not really that important. So. You know, the point is not all doctors are geniuses. I mean, you, you probably met a few that you know are not, right? And that's what I find is so amazing is that we tend to just look at somebody based on their position and, and believe everything that they say. When the reality is you shouldn't believe anything anybody says. You should understand and, you know, you should definitely find people who you trust their opinions, but understand it's still an opinion because as a doctor... I'm just like you, you know, I, my education was different than you, but what's really important as a doctor is a differentiator of information. That's what really is important in the 21st century is, is the ability to look at objectives and understand th this is one option. This is another option. This is a better option than this one. But see, it all comes down to just like in religion. I mean, it's the same thing in religion. You, you, you better, not, you know, you don't want to just listen to anybody because they're a pastor. Right. Does that really mean much nowadays? No. It means that they went to school and they got a degree in divinity. And unfortunately, a lot of them go to school. Why? Because they know it's a great job. And they can't do anything. Right. It's really sad. You know, so, but the point is, you want to know that you can trust their information, you can trust them because they've earned it. And I'm just, uh, oh, it bothers me so much, you know, that that there's this, there's still this ore out there that just because they're in a big building surrounded by fancy technology and wearing white coats that all of a sudden they're geniuses. And it's just not true. I would love to sit down and debate openly with them any day of the week because what comes first is core philosophy. If your core philosophy is wrong, the rest of it is garbage. You're going to be lucky to get anything good out of your mouth. And that's the problem with the system is a core philosophy is wrong of outside in. That you've got to get me well uh, healthy from the outside in. <laughs> Wealthy too. Right? You, it, it all comes from the outside in. And that's a faulty premise. The premise is above, down, inside, out. Your body heals above, down, inside, out. You know, an, an aborigine in the middle of the Australian desert heals just like you do sitting right here. And they don't have the same doctors out there. If they cut their leg, they're healing the same way. So it's a faulty premise, and that's got to be the biggest picture. So, you know, th th this, this thing just drives the whole system, you know, because people continue to flock back to the system despite knowing what doesn't work and, and seeing the flaws in it, they keep on flocking back to the system because ultimately that's where science is, right? That's, they've got the science, and unfortunately it's just not true.
I, I, I hear non-scientific garbage all, all week long. Top 10 pharma companies by revenue, 2013. You can look through these. I'm not going to list through all of them. These are, these are some of the drugs that they've created. But you know, Johnson & Johnson, Tylenol and Motrin, a lot of the over-the-counter stuff, $71 billion in profit. So those, you can see with those kind of profits, you can see why they pay the money that they do to lobby. But you're going to say, or, or let's say how they pay the money that they do to lobby. But when you look at how it actually works, this is amazing. This is the amazing return of investment on corporate lobbying. Compare the expected return of every dollar spent lobbying blows any ordinary investment strategy out of the water, even a blue chip stock. It's no wonder 3.5 billion were spent lobbying in 2010. So here's how it works. If you as an ordinary American invest in a blue chip stock with a return of, uh, if you invested in the Dow Jones Industrial Average Companies in 2010, you would have earned an average of 11 cents for every dollar invested. So you would have started with a dollar and you would have ended up with a dollar and 11 cents. Okay, that's what you and me, the average re rate of return is. For big fossil fuel companies, okay, uh, the lobbies on oil subsidies, the oil, gas, and coal industry heavily lobbies Washington. During the 100th and 11th Congress, they gave $347 million in campaign contributions. Okay, the same Congress approved over $20 billion in subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. That means for every dollar spent on lobbying, they receive $59 in subsidies. That's a return of investment of $5,900. Okay? It gets better. Multinationals lobby for corporate tax break. Uh, in 2004, 93 U.S. corporations lobbied for a temporary tax break to bring their offshore profit back to U.S. banks. They argued that the money saved would be spent on creating jobs. All right? And that's what we're all about, creating jobs. The company spent $283 million lobbying for the measure, which passed. Because of it, they paid $63 billion less in taxes. That's a return of investment of 22,000%. The company has only spent 9% of their savings on new jobs. Okay? But none of those compare to what the pharmaceutical companies are doing. Big pharma lobbies to keep drug prices high. President Bush created our federal prescription drug program for seniors in 2003. The pharmaceutical industry then spent $116 million lobbying to bar Medicare from bargaining for competitive drug prices. So they cannot bargain for prices. They have to pay what the drug companies ask. If Medicare could negotiate drug prices, it would save approximately $90 billion a year for prescriptions. That's a 77,000% return of investment for the drug companies. Unreal, isn't it? So what's happening is they're, they're, it's costing them a fraction of a penny to produce a pill, and they're selling it sometimes for over $100 a pill. It's unreal. So here's the personal solutions. These are the things that you can take home. These are the things that you can actually do. A lot of these, you know, you, you don't need me to tell you. But number one, invest in your family's health. Don't wait for sickness because those days are over. You got that? I mean, the way that insurance and regulation is happening, the days are over. Everybody's panicking now because they're realizing with the model not being sustainable, they're not going to be there to pay for your health care expenses. So if you're, especially if you're young, I mean, if you're older right now, you're kind of in the sweet spot actually uh, because you've got it at the best that it's going to be. But if you're younger, you know, if you're less than 50, we've got problems. We've got a lot, you know, ahead of us. So we better be keeping our, ourselves and our families healthy. Number two, buy into an HSA as long as they last. They may not be around much longer because the way that legislation is, it's, it might actually turn out where HSA, health savings accounts, they're actually obsolete. They, they won't be able to compete. So right now, the way that works is you put in money or your company puts in money into your HSA and then you choose where you spend that money. So we have some patients with HSAs, they come in and they want to start caring. They say, well, actually, I, you know, I've got $3,000 on my HSA, so let's just, let's just put it on that. They chose what they did with their healthcare money, and they, and they can. Or they could go to the medical doctor, but if you, have a ch if you have an option between medical care and chiropractic care on an open table, guess what? Most people are gonna choose wellness care. If they have the option, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
actually uh, cut that, at least the, the flex spinning, which I'm sure is a type of HSA. Yes, it is. They cut it in half. You used to be able to set aside a maximum, government maximum of a, over five thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and now it's uh, under three. There you go. Yeah. So yeah, that's they still, you know, will, even though you have receipts and things like that, they that's your money, and then they'll say, well, they have to approve it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We we run into situations like that too. Yeah. So there's still that's what I'm saying. They're still available, but they're cutting them, and it's getting to the point where they're they're not going to be qualifies as draft. You got it. Yep. Okay. Uh, medical sharing programs. Fortunately, these do still exist. Uh, there's a there's a clause in in the policy that says that a like a Christian based medical sharing program qualifies as personal insurance. So this is what my family does. We're we're signed up with uh, MediShare, and so it's a high deductible insurance policy. Basically, it's not insurance, it's a medical sharing program. So the way it works, we pay for our entire family, it's like $140 a month. Okay, We have a $10,000 deductible. As a chiropractor, and you guys know how I live, when do you think I'm going to go to the hospital or go to a doctor? When something is seriously wrong, right? When am I going to call my insurance company for my car? When I need an oil change? <laughs> When I need a car wash, when you got no. a bone sticking out through, when the I got yeah, when I hit, when I get hit, that's when I'm calling my insurance company. That's the way insurance is supposed to be. Right. Your house insurance, you don't call them unless your house caught on fire, right. right? That's what it's supposed to be, not you know going for every little ache, scrape, and cut. And so we have a high deductible, ten thousand dollar deductible because I ain't going unless I'm bleeding in the unconscious or bone sticking out or something like that. That's when we're going, and if it's if uh, if we have to go, you know, because you know a kid breaks a finger or something like that, we're going to pay for it out of pocket. But we save enough in 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 copays or not copays, but uh, insurance premiums that you know it pays for it by the end of the year easily if you're a healthy individual. Hence, going back to number one, you've got to put health as the number one priority. But this program will exempt you as of right now from having to buy into these, you know, sick, Obamacare. we've had multiple patients who have actually switched over to the MediShare um, and they, they've come in at less than $150 where they have, their insurance premiums had jumped to six to $800. And so they switched over, they were like, well, that's a no brainer, we're switching over. And uh, in the meantime, we're gonna sign our whole family up for the next year. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like they, on that even table, it actually works out good because it sh it puts the power back in the in the patient's hand on what to do. Okay, uh, number three, price out what you would have spent on traditional insurance. Okay, find out what it would actually cost you to buy insurance through Blue Cross Blue Shield, or if you switch, you already know, right? And then instead of spending it on a new car in Disney World and new clothes and movies and everything else, save it, put it in an account and save it so that you have it for the things that come up that you actually need because you know things aren't exactly great in the economy right now mm -hmm. right so you never know what's going to be coming up around the bend so put the money away and save it for what is necessary number four don't be cheap on vitamins because you get cheap vitamins right mm -hmm. I mean don't buy the stuff from from Walmart that's made by the drug companies mm -hmm. they don't want to feed you good quality high, high quality vitamins now it's different if you know there's a good brand and you can get it cheaper somewhere else or you know you can buy cheaper on Amazon than the health food store or something like that's not what we're talking about we're, I'm just saying get good quality vitamins I'm, I, that's not a ploy just buy you know buy my vitamins here yeah we have good ones here but the point is buy good vitamins don't start on vitamin D supreme here and then go to Wal or Sam's Club and buy a you know a gallon jar that costs you five bucks it's garbage right okay uh, number five, exercise outside or at home unless you need a trainer. Okay, gym gym owners hate me for saying this, and they they would chastise me for saying this. Um, if you're one of those that you need to go to a gym, then go to a gym. If if that's the motivation, you have to go to a gym or you're not going to work out. Go to a gym. My point is, you don't necessarily need a gym, right? You can work out at home. You can work out outside and you actually fulfill your vitamin D at the same time if you're doing it outside. The point is just exercise. You can exercise anywhere. Just get it in there. 
Number six, maximize your home environment. Clean your water, clean your air, and get rid of the chemicals. Okay, uh, you guys see here we've got the, uh, the Air Oasis uh, air cleaners. We've got a few of them like up at the front desk. I just installed in my, in my house one of their new induct units. So it's, a, it's a, uh, a device like this that's got a big long tube off of it and it goes inside of your air duct. And it's got a UV light on it, a high power UV light that kills all the bacteria and germs and everything else, all the viruses, all that. It kills that, but it also spews out ions. And so when every time your air conditioning or your heat turns on, it blows all that out into your house. And like literally as soon as the air kicks on, we can smell the ions. You know, you can smell the, but they're not ozone. Um, they're completely inert ingredients. There's a box up front uh, on the top shelf that, that uh, you, can, you can pick up the box and read about how it works and everything. But it's cool because it cleans out your entire house from one unit directly inside of your duct. And you never have to you have, you have to go back and change a bulb like once every two years, so you know they're not they're not necessarily cheap to put in. It's like that the prices are up front, but I mean to clean your whole house, it the the ions connect with the stuff in the air and they drop to the floor. It makes them heavy and they drop to the floor, and then you just go back and you vacuum it up every time that you vacuum. You're pulling out everything that was in the air. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, we were in a church yesterday for a homeschool group, and oh my gosh. The minute I walked in there, I was just like, I mean, you could smell the mold in the air. And I was just like, this place needs one of these bad. <laughs> uh, clean your water. Over at Red Bar, we use Aquaspace. At home, we use Aquaspace. Those, those machines are awesome. They're just under, under the sink units that pull out the fluoride and all the other contaminants. They pull out the chlorine. They pull out everything. And so, like, even our ice over next door is, like, unbelievably clean. So those units are great. Um, you can get, uh, if, you, if you order an Aquaspace filter from the company, you can tell them I want the Dr. Mike Bucknell discount and they'll give you a 20%, I think it's a 20% discount off of it or 25% or something like that. Uh, so those units are great. You just gotta make sure that you get the fluoride reducing triple filter that goes under or over the sink. And then no chemicals, just get rid of the chemicals. Go through your cabinets, anything that you would not swallow, get rid of it, throw it out. It doesn't need to be in your house because every time you use it, you're pouring chemicals in your environment. Where do they go? They don't have anywhere to go. It's not like they get diluted in the rain. There is no rain. You're inside, right? So they stay inside. Okay? Eat real food. Number seven, eat real food. Don't eat stuff that is not real food. See, we call stuff food anything that we can put in our mouths. But that's not food. If you want to know what food is, go on YouTube and watch my workshop, The Owner's Manual. I'll show you what food is, okay? But you need to know what food is. If it's, not, if it's something that's not digestible, it's not food. If it's not something that's supposed to be ingested, it's not food. That's, the way that, that's another means of staying healthy. Read our advanced plan diet or our core plan diet. That will tell you what is food and what is not in a real simple one-page format. Number eight, realize the only thing most doctors know more than you is what they were taught. This is what I went through on the last thing. That is the truth. I hate to tell you, that is the truth. Most doctors don't know any more than what they were taught. You know, so uh, I, uh, what, I love this one up here. He's the best physician who knows the worthiness, the worthlessness of most medicines. That's not just talking about pills and lotions and stuff. It's the worthlessness of uh, being able to differentiate that a, the magic foot bath is a piece of garbage. You guys know what I'm talking about? The thing at the health food store that you like put your feet in it and start spewing out brown stuff that's supposed to be yeast. It's a magic rust bucket. It doesn't work. You know, um, people are, uh, you know, they, the essential oils thing now. I mean, essential oils are great, but overpaying three times for oils that are no better than you can pay for another ones, that's not the smartest thing to do. You know, so that's really the future of healthcare is using an education to differentiate between your options and being able to distill the information because like I spend my entire life in healthcare distilling information, right? Do you want to spend your entire life distilling healthcare information? No. So what do you do? You have a coach to teach you the stuff so you don't have to go and research it all. You would hire a financial coach to teach you all that stuff. If you have a legal matter 
you would get a lawyer to teach you all of that stuff. If you, you know, if you don't want to be spending all day long every day reading the reading the Bible, you would get a you would get a, a religious coach, a pastor, right? You would do these things. You get these experts in different areas so that you don't have to be an expert in every area because a jack of all trades is a master of none, right? Collaborate in information, but this is the reality. Most doctors do their job and go home, and they don't change their philosophy or what they know for thirty years. How does a how does a doctor that's been in practice for 20 years not know anything about nutrition? I don't get that. Like, but that happens all the time. I find that out. And, and even, I mean, it's not just medical doctors. It's chiropractors too. I have patients coming here and they're, they're like my chiropractor. I, you know, uh, they, they usually come in with somebody else and they're like, oh, I see a chiropractor. My chiropractor, I asked them blah, blah, blah. And, they, and they're, they're like, oh, I don't know. I mean, it's like a simple question. And uh, so anyway, you see it frustrates me a little bit. Um, number nine, protect your children and yourselves from unnecessary vaccines, drugs, surgeries, and other interferences to normal bodily function. Function is key. That is the absolute pinnacle of health is function. You've got to protect function. So anything that interferes with normal function should automatically be frowned upon. Okay.